friends and welcome to my channel. Today we will be learning about the femur. The femur or the thigh bone is the longest and strongest bone in the body. It has two ends, an upper end, a lower end and a shaft. Now how do we determine the side of a femur? The upper end bears a large rounded head while the lower end is expanded to form two condyles. The head is directed medially and the cylindrical shaft, as you see here, is convex forwards. Now, if we try considering this femur as of the left side, we will see that the head is facing medially, but the cylindrical shaft does not have its convex surface facing forwards. So, we will try keeping this in the right side. Now, we notice that the head is facing medially and the convex surface of the shaft is facing forwards. So we come to the conclusion that this femur is of the right side. Now let's learn about the anatomical position of the femur. The head of the femur is erected medially upwards and slightly forwards. Medially means towards the body. Now the shaft is directed obliquely downwards and medially such that the lower surfaces of the two condyles lie in the same horizontal plane. Now let's learn about the upper end of the femur. The upper end has a rounded head, a neck as you can see here, the greater trochander, a lesser trochander, an intertrochandric line and an intertrochandric crest. The head forms more than half of a sphere. It is directed medially, upwards and slightly forwards. It articulates with the acetabulum to form the hip joint. A roughened pit is present just below and beneath the centre of the head. This pit is called the fovea. Now let's look at the neck. The neck connects the head with the shaft. It is 3.7 cm long. It has two borders and two surfaces. The upper border is concave and horizontal. It meets the shaft at the greater trochander. The lower border is oblique and straight. It meets the shaft at the lesser trochander. The anterior surface is smooth and it meets the shaft at the intertrochandric line. It is intracapsular. The posterior surface is concave from side to side and convex from above downwards. It meets the shaft at the intertrochandric crest. The neck makes an angle with the shaft. This is called the neck shaft angle. It is about 125 degree in adults. It is lesser in females due to their wider pelvis. This angle facilitates the movements at the hip joint. The trochander shaft angle is about 8 degree in adults. It is an important radiological parameter as it gives an idea about the direction of the medullary canal and its alignment with the greater trochander. Now let's look at the greater trochander. The greater trochander is a large quadrangular prominence located at the upper part of the junction of the neck with the shaft. The upper border of the trochander lies at the level of the center of the head. The greater trochander has an upper border with an apex and three surfaces, the anterior, the lateral and the medial surface. The anterior surface is rough in its lateral part. The lateral surface presents an oblique ridge which is directed downwards. The medial surface presents a rough impression above and a deep trochandric fossa below. The lesser trochander is a conical eminence directed medially and backwards. The intertrochandric line marks the junction between the neck and the shaft of the femur. It begins above at the greater trochander as a tubercle and continues downwards with a spiral line in front of the lesser trochander. The spiral line continues downwards and reaches the posterior surface of the shaft of the femur. The intertrochandric crest marks the junction between the posterior surface of the neck of the femur with its shaft. It begins above at the posterosuperior angle of the greater trochander and runs downwards to end at the lesser trochander. There is a rounded elevation just above the middle of the intertrochandric crest which is called the quadrate tubercle. Now let's look at the shaft. The shaft is more or less cylindrical and is more expanded inferiorly than superiorly. 
It is convex anteriorly as you can see here and directed medially downwards and obliquely because the upper ends of the two femora are separated by the width of the pelvis and the lower ends are close together. In the middle one third, the shaft has three borders and three surfaces. The medial border, the lateral border and the posterior border as you can see here. Three surfaces, the anterior surface, the medial surface and the lateral surface. The medial and lateral borders are ill-defined but the posterior border is in the form of a rough and rich called the linea aspera. The linea aspera has two lips, the lateral and the medial lip. In the upper one third of the shaft, the two lips of the linea aspera diverge to enclose an additional posterior surface. Thus, this part has four borders and four surfaces. The medial border, the lateral border, the spiral line and the lateral lip of the gluteal tuberosity and four surfaces, the anterior surface, the medial surface, the lateral surface and the posterior surface. The gluteal tuberosity is a roughened impression on the posterior surface of the upper one third of the shaft. The gluteal tuberosity is a roughened ridge on the lateral part of the posterior surface. In the lower one third of the shaft also, the two lips of the linea aspera diverge to enclose an additional popliteal surface. So this part also has four borders and four surfaces. The lateral border, the medial border, the lateral supracondylar line, the medial supracondylar line and four surfaces, the anterior surface, the lateral surface, the medial surface and the popliteal surface. The lower end of the femur is widely expanded to form two large condyles, the medial condyle and the lateral condyle. Anteriorly they are united, posteriorly they are separated by a deep gap called the intercondylar fossa or the intercondylar notch which lies much beyond the plane of the popliteal surface. Now let's look at the articular surfaces. The two condyles are partially covered by a large articular surface which is divisible into a petala and tibial parts. The articular surface for the petala covers the anterior surfaces of both the condyles. It extends more on the lateral condyle than on the medial condyle. It is separated by a faint vertical groove. The tibial surface covers the inferior and posterior surfaces of the condyles. It is united anteriorly with the articular surface of the petala. Now let's look at the lateral condyle. The lateral condyle is flat laterally and is more in line with the shaft. It therefore takes greater part in transmission of the body weight to the tibia. Though it is less prominent than the medial condyle, it is stouter and stronger. The lateral aspect presents the following. A prominence called the lateral epicondyle, a popliteal groove which lies just below the epicondyle, it has a deep anterior part and a shallow posterior part, a muscular impression postero superior to the epicondyle that is right here. Now let's look at the medial condyle. The medial condyle is convex medially, the prominent point on it is called the medial epicondyle. Postero superior to the medial epicondyle is the adductor tubercle. This tubercle is an important landmark. The epiphyseal line for the lower end of the femur passes through it. Now let's look at the intercondylar notch or the intercondylar fossa. The notch separates the lower and posterior parts of the two condyles. It is limited anteriorly by the articular surface for the petala and posteriorly by the intercondylar line which separates the notch from the popliteal surface. Now before I start with the attachments on the femur, please note that the red color symbolizes the origin of muscles, the blue color indicates the insertion of muscles and the green color indicates the attachments of ligaments and joint capsules. Beginning with the head of the femur, the fovea provides attachment to the ligament of the head of the femur or the round ligament, also called the ligamentum teres 
or ligamentum femoris. The green color indicates the attachment. Moving on to the attachments on the greater trochanter, the piriformis is inserted into the apex right here. The gluteus minimus is inserted into the rough lateral part of the anterior surface. The obturator internus and the two gamelae are inserted into the upper rough impression on the medial surface right here. The obturator externus is inserted into the trochanteric fossa. Here is the obturator externus. And finally, the gluteus medius is inserted into the ridge on the lateral surface right here. This is the ligament of the head of the femur, also called the ligamentum teres. This is the piriformis. This muscle you see here is the gluteus minimus. This muscle you see here is the obturator externus. This is the gluteus medius. Now an easy way to remember the attachments on the greater trochander is by the use of the mnemonic good pogo. Good stands for the insertion of gluteus medius. P for the insertion of piriformis, O for the insertion of obturator internus, G for the insertion of gluteus minimus and O for the insertion of obturator externus. Now let's look at the attachments on the lesser trochanter. The psoas major is inserted on the apex and medial part of the rough anterior surface, right here. The iliacus is inserted on the anterior surface of the base of the trochanter and on the area below it, right here. This is the psoas major muscle. This is the iliacus muscle. Moving on to the attachments on the intertrochandric line. It gives attachment to the capsular ligament of the hip joint. It also gives attachment to the upper band of the iliofemoral ligament in its upper part. The lower band of the iliofemoral ligament in its lower part. It gives origin to the highest fibers of the vastus lateralis from its upper end. It also gives origin to the highest fibers of the vastus medialis from its lower end. This is the iliofemoral ligament. This muscle you see here is the vastus lateralis and this is the vastus medialis. Now an easy way to remember the attachments on the intertrochanteric line is by the use of the mnemonic very very clever Indian. Very stands for origin of vastus lateralis. The next very stands for the origin of vastus medialis. Clever stands for the attachment of the capsular ligament and Indian stands for the iliofemoral ligament. The quadrate tubercle receives the insertion of the quadratus femoris. This muscle you see here is the quadratus femoris. Now let's look at the attachments on the shaft. The vastus intermedius arises from the upper three-fourths of the anterior and lateral surfaces. Articularis genu arises just below the vastus intermedius. The vastus lateralis arises from the upper part of the intertrochanteric line the anterior and inferior aspects of the greater trochanter, the lateral margin of the gluteal tuberosity and the upper half of the lateral lip of the linea aspera, right till here. The vastus medialis arises from the lower part of the intertrochanteric line, the spiral line, the medial lip of the linea aspera and the medial supracondylar line. The medial and the popliteal surfaces are bare except for the origin of the medial head of the gastrocnemius to the medial part of the popliteal surface. This is the vastus intermedius muscle. This is the vastus medialis. This is the vastus lateralis. This is the medial head of the gastrocnemius. This is the articularis genu. The gluteal tuberosity gives insertion to the deeper fibers of the lower half of the gluteus maximus muscle. This is the gluteus maximus muscle. The pectineus is inserted on a line extending from the lesser trochanter to the linea aspera. The lower end of the lateral supracondylar ridge gives origin to the plantaris above and the upper part of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius below. This is the pectineus muscle. This is the short head of the biceps femoris. This is the plantaris muscle. Now, in order to avoid confusions, we will learn about the attachments on the linea aspera with the help of a mnemonic. Before I get into the mnemonic, let me brief about the muscles which are originating and inserting on the linea aspera from the lateral to the medial aspect. 
there is the origin of the vastus intermedius, the vastus lateralis, the short head of the biceps femoris, the insertion of the adductor magnus, insertion of the adductor brevis, insertion of the adductor longus and pectineus, and finally the origin of vastus medialis. This muscle you see here is the adductor brevis, this is the adductor longus and this is the adductor magnus. This is the mnemonic that is used for learning the attachments on the linea aspera. I love B, Mr. B loves me. I stands for the origin of vastus intermedius, L for the origin of vastus lateralis, B for the origin of short head of biceps femoris, M for the insertion of adductor magnus, B for the adductor brevis, L for the adductor longus and pectineus, and V for the origin of vastus medialis. All these attachments are from the lateral to the medial lip of the linea aspera. Now let's look at the attachments on the lateral condyle. The fibular collateral ligament of the knee joint is attached to the lateral epicondyle. The popliteus arises from the deep anterior part of the popliteal groove. When the knee is flexed, the tendon of this muscle lies in the shallow posterior part of this groove. The muscular impression near the lateral epicondyle gives origin to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, right here. Now let's look at the attachments on the medial condyle. The medial epicondyle gives attachment to the tibial collateral ligament. The adductor tubercle receives insertion of the ischial head of the adductor magnus, right here. Now let's look at the attachments on the intercondylar notch. The anterior cruciate ligament is attached to the posterior part of the medial surface of the lateral condyle on a smooth impression. The posterior cruciate ligament is attached to the anterior part of the lateral surface of the medial condyle on a smooth impression, right here. This is the fibula collateral ligament. This is the tibial collateral ligament. This is the popliteus muscle. This is the tibial articular surface and this is the anterior cruciate ligament. This is the posterior cruciate ligament. I hope you found this video helpful. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.